So um, here is the starting point uh, of my uh, reflection. So uh, first of all, uh, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about uh, earth system sciences and their normative implications. So it's fair to say that environmental scientists have been warning us for decades that economic activities are pushing against and even crossing natural limits. But as we enter the 21st century, I think we can say that the planetary boundary framework changed the game. This planetary boundary framework uh, stresses nine planetary boundaries in the Earth system. It also stresses the existence of tipping points in these boundaries, and it quantifies both the boundaries and their tipping points. So here you can see two figures that represent different planetary boundary sphere, especially climate change, biodiversity loss, and also the perturbation of the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. And here you can see a representation of active tipping points uh, in the Earth system, such as uh, ice loss in Greenland, ice sheet, Amazon rain, forest uh, dieback, and also uh, coral reef bleaching. So over the last decade, Earth system scientists have developed three very important insights. The first is that the Anthropocene probably started in the mid 1950s due to the exponential increase of material energy flows underlying our eco economic activities. Some are saying that the Anthropocene started before, but there is a kind of emerging consensus now on the mid fifties to say that this is the starting point of the Anthropocene. Uh, the second insight is that the Anthropocene is uh, functionally and statigraphically distinct from the Holocene. And the Holocene was a remarkably stable epoch that lasted for more than 10,000 years, allowing our complex societies to develop. The third insight is that Earth's tipping points are both too close for comfort and too risky to bet against. So for, the, for these reasons, uh, Earth system scientists um, are telling us today that we are in a state of uh, planet emergency. This is uh, published in uh, the journal Nature. It's a very strong message. Um, they also explain um, that the scale uh, of recent changes across the climate system as a whole and uh, the present state of many aspects of the climate system are unprecedented over many centuries to many thousands of years. And they also add that many changes due to past and future greenhouse gas emissions are irreversible for centuries and millennia. So these notions of uh, un Precedented and irreversible are very strong as well. Um, finally, they also warn us that currently the Earth system is on what they call a hot house Earth pathway, which is driven by human emissions of greenhouse gases and by biosphere degradation towards a planetary threshold of two degrees Celsius approximately, uh, beyond which the system follows an essentially irreversible pathway driven by intrinsic biogeophysical feedback. So here again, we have this idea of irreversibility. And here you see a representation of the current trajectory we are on. So we are currently here, um, the planetary threshold of approximately two degrees Celsius of total warming is here. And if we keep on going and following this path, we will end up with a hot house earth pathway. A hot house earth pathway is a pathway in which uh, climate change generates itself, and we cannot do anything to stop global warming. Now that we know the scale of what we are up against, feeling anxiety is close to unavoidable. In response to uh, these more and more numerous, accurate and accessible empirical data on the rapidly degrading state of the planet, there is a corresponding increase in pessimistic perceptions of the future through fictional narratives. So here I just give a few famous examples of these narratives, uh, but there are many other possible illustrations. Uh, the notion of scenario, which is ubiquitous in IPCC reports and uh, scientific articles on climate change, usually refer uh, in a general way to a reasoned effort of anticipation in a film or in a novel. Scenarios are fictions depicting possible worlds and they illustrate what kind of future might result from current trends, uh, such as the continued use of fossil fuels 
to supply global energy demand. In the genre uh, of eco-fiction and the subgenre of climate fiction or cli-fi, which are illustrated here, uh, more and more novels and film explore apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic scenarios in which anthropogenic ecological disaster completely changes the world as we know it. Even if these uh, Anthropocene fictions draw more or less accurately on scientific knowledge, they contribute to influencing popular perceptions of the near and distant future. These fictions link numbers, graphs, and figures with our daily lives. They make the notion of the Anthropocene more tangible. So we can say that together, uh, scientific knowledge and Anthropocene fictions contribute to making anxiety a defining feature of our time. Just as Rawls perceived what I called the fact of reasonable pluralism as a permanent feature of democratic public culture, we can consider today that the fact of anxiety is a pervasive characteristic of life in the Anthropocene. Global environmental changes such as Anthropocene mass extinction, climate change, and ozone depletion give rise to a specific form of anxiety, which has been called eco-anxiety. So there's a raising literature on this from a scientific perspective, but so far most of uh, the inputs we have on this notion of eco-anxiety come from the media. And uh, this presentation does two things. First, it tries to draw the contours of the notion of eco-anxiety it tries to define it. And second, it suggests possible remedies to it. It tries to find ways to uh, fight against it. So the objective is to identify key features of eco-anxiety and to think about its normative implications in terms of responsibility for young people and uh, future generation in line with uh, the topic of uh, this seminar you are organizing. So first, what is eco-anxiety? So I will just like to uh, share with you a working uh, definition here. So it's not finished and uh, any feedback on it would be uh, very welcome. So I think we can define eco-anxiety as a subjective trait state or disposition, which is turned toward a possible objective state of the planet uh, in the near or dis distant future. The object of eco-anxiety is severe or harmful ecological risks uh, that are not yet here in space or present in time, but which might happen in the more or less distant future. Ego anxiety is a fear, uh, and it results from an acute awareness of the risks raised by global ecological issues or global ecological changes. Ego anxiety can lead to a generalized feeling of discouragement and taken to too high a degree it can also become a pathological, a fear of a fear or an exaggeration of the probabilities of environmental dangers. So what I would like to do now is uh, unpack, the, unpack the three main elements of this definition. So the first element is that equal anxiety is future oriented. And this is the case for any form of anxiety. But the envisioned future uh, can be more or less determinate, more or less near, but it is both threatening and uncertain. The future is considered as threatening and uncertain. The main object of eco-anxiety is ecological risks. For instance, sea level rise, uh, mega fires, uh, and ex extreme climate events we have been uh, observing all around the globe the last few years, such as hurricanes, droughts, heat waves, and floods. And its object can also be the consequences of this phenomena on human and non-human beings. For instance, animal suffering, ecosystem degradation, species extinction, the disruption of agricultural systems and food supply chains, economic shocks, social political instability, as well as starvation, mass migration, conflicts, and even eventually social collapse. Now, risk and uncertainty are uh, intrinsically linked. Risks are indeed the product of both magnitude and probability. The magnitude is a measure of the seriousness of the loss and damage at stake, 
while the probability is a measure of the likelihood of such loss and damage occurring. Question of probability can, uh, however, become less relevant if the magnitude of the uh, possible loss and damage is massive, such as the triggering of a hot house earth pathway. In such cases, it is possible to replace the category of risk with the category of danger. A cascade of tipping points uh, in the climate system would indeed represent what we can call a transcendental danger, that is, a danger that threatens the very condition of human existence on the planet, or at least the conditions for a flourishing human life. So you can recognize here kind of Kenshin flavor to this notion of transcendental danger. It's about the condition of possibility of human life or a flourishing human life. Transcendental dangers link eco-anxiety with another form of anxiety, uh, which is existential anxiety. It is a form of anxiety focusing on the threats to the very existence of humans and societies. So that's the first element of uh, eco-anxiety. Let's move now to the second. Eco-anxiety is also a state of fear and insecurity in the face of ecological risks and uh, transcendental dangers. Eco-anxiety is an emotion that reaches deep. It is a gut feeling that most, if not all future scenarios are insecure. It is a constant fear that we are contributing with our individual and collective lifestyles to creating a more dangerous world for young people and future generations. This feeling of fear and insecurity does not necessarily require the direct experience or observation of a dangerous anthropogenic ecological event to exist. Merely imagining or projecting a risk or danger is sufficient to trigger eco-anxiety. Eco-fictions or Anthropocene fictions provide a visual representation of the dark side of the Anthropocene. They set in motion images that are the interpretative representation of a crucial concept in the Anthropocene, the concept or notion of ecological disaster. Ecological disasters confront us, uh, whether we are simply spectators or actors, whether we are observers or victims, with the unthinkable, the inconceivable, the impossible. The word that best corresponds to our direct or indirect exposure to ecological disaster is stupefaction. And stupefaction entails suspension of the movement of thought and action. Words resist, and a key objective of eco-fiction movies is to express the disaster through images rather than through concepts. The third uh, and last element of definition that I would like to propose is that anxiety usually leads to uh, a form of paralysis or a form of suspension of action. Fear can sometimes be motivating, for instance, when it pushes us to avoid its object or its source, but it can also very easily be paralyzing. Ecofictions can incite us to avoid the disaster they depict by changing our behavior and reforming our institutions, but they can just as easily block our individual actions by showing us the futility of our efforts. Likewise, learning about the existence of the nine planetary boundaries, the crossing of four of them, and the possibility of tipping points in the Earth system can be discouraging. What can I possibly do as an individual in the face of such gigantic forces? Equine anxiety uh, can therefore lead to a generalized feeling of discouragement regarding the future and what we can do about it both individually and collectively. So this third feature shows how easily equine anxiety can become pathological. Neither eco-fiction film directors nor Earth system scientists wish to convey the message that individual action is futile. Quite the contrary, their films and publications is usually a call to action. At the same time, given the scale and the gravity of the problems they discuss and what is at stake, one can understandably feel overwhelmed. Doom and gloom narratives can cause despair, and despair can in turn they motivate people in ways 
that could exacerbate ecological problems. When eco-anxiety gives way to despair, it becomes a fear of fear, an exaggeration of the possibilities of transcendental dangers. At that point, there is little chance that eco-anxiety will leave space for possible solutions to avoid the realization of the darkest scenarios. So to finish this kind of uh, exploration of the notion of eco-anxiety, I would like to ask how widespread it is. So degrees of eco-anxiety vary according to different factors, for instance, age, profession, location on the planet. Um, but the limited available data indicate that it is spreading very fast. Two categories of people seem to be particularly affected by eco-anxiety. Climate scientists uh, on the one hand, and uh, children and young people on the other hand. So a first survey, um, as you can see here, has found that many IPCC authors are suffering from eco-anxiety, with more than 60% of the respondents to the study uh, saying that they experience anxiety, grief, or other distress because of concerns over climate change. 82% of the respondents uh, report that they think they will see catastrophic impacts of climate change in their lifetime, and 6 in 10 expect the world to warm by at least 3 degrees above pre-industrial level by the end of the century. So these data are quite recent because they are taken from the authors who have participated to the most recent uh, report published by uh, the first working group of the IPCC. A second uh, survey, uh, which is uh, still under review, um, has found out that a huge and growing number of children and young people from a diverse range of countries with a diverse range of income and exposure to climate impact are suffering from eco-anxiety. So here are a few other uh, numbers that explain how widespread eco-anxiety is. While 59% of children and young people uh, in this survey say that they feel very or extremely worried about climate change, 45% say that their feeling about climate change negatively affect their lives on a daily basis. So this is not just abstract, it's really everything, something that happens every day. 75% of the respondents find the future frightening. Uh, 55, 56% believe that humanity is doomed. 55 think that they will have fewer opportunities than their parents. 52% believe that their family's security will be threatened. And 39% are even hesitant to have children. In total, more than half of the respondents say that they feel afraid, sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, and or guilty. This study also found that the psychological state of children and young people is not only affected by climate impacts or ecological risks in general, but also by their perception of government's failure to respond to environmental issues. And this failure of response leads to a feeling of betrayal and abandonment by adults. So always the same study. Uh, so the same study highlights that all the stressors will have significant, long-lasting and incremental negative implications on the mental health of children and young people. So here we clearly have uh, the pathological effect of eco-anxiety that is well illustrated. The same study also frames government failure as what they call a failure of ethical responsibility to care and a source of moral injury. And here they understand moral injury as the distressing psychological aftermath experienced when one perpetrates and or witnesses actions that violate moral or core beliefs. So here we clearly have a very strong normative implication. Finally, the study also uh, stresses um, that uh, adults and government hold a moral responsibility. And I think here we can use David Miller's uh, framework of responsibility to explain in what sense adults and governments are morally responsible. 
They are responsible for the outcome of their lack of action on the psychological state of children and young people on the one hand, but they are also responsible for remedying this outcome by helping those who suffer from eco-anxiety. So now that we know more about the meaning of anxiety, we can ask what can be done about it. Since eco-anxiety is a distinct feature of the Anthropocene, a key component of the fact of anxiety, it is in some sense unavoidable. The point is therefore not so much to try to escape this state as to mitigate it as far as possible in order to avoid its undesirable side effects such as paralysis and its pathological effects such as despair. So a first intuitive counterpower that comes to mind is of course hope. Some climate justice uh, scholars have recently emphasized the value of hope in the climate change discourse by promoting uh, what they call climate hope. So in this perspective, hope applies to an object that is first desired, second believed to be possible, but that remains uncertain, and third characterized by a certain mental emphasis that makes the desire and the belief of the hoper significant and stable. So the mental emphasis uh, is on the possibility of, of a positive outcome, but at the same time, hope and pessimism can coexist. And Dominique Roser explains this by writing uh, in a recent publication, I can believe X to have a low probability, condition two, but can still desire X, condition one, and psychologically rally around X, condition three. So we can be hopeful and pessimistic at the same time. These are not exclusive states. And Roser illustrates this with the case of the 1.5 degree uh, climate target that has been so much discussed recently uh, during COP26. Even if there is a low probability that we will keep the temperature increase below 1.5 degrees Celsius, this goal remains possible and desirable and can therefore be an object of hope. Uh, Dominic Roser adds that it is not only justifiable to hope to achieve the 1.5 degrees target, but that there are also good reasons for cultivating hope of achieving this goal. The reason for this is that the advantages of hoping for this target, that is a motivational and hedonistic benefit, outweighs its disadvantages, which are the temptation of wishful thinking, disappointment, and destruction. And the motivational benefit of hope is especially relevant, I think, in discussion on eco-anxiety. One crucial reason why cultivating hope is so important is that hope can contribute to increasing the probability of achieving the hoped for outcome. While anxiety leads to overwhelm, discouragement, and even paralysis, hope can work as a remedy thanks to its instrumental value. A hopeful disposition can represent a source of personal motivation to overcome collective action problems such as climate change. So this is the positive side of hope, but I think there is also a more negative side because hope is an ambiguous state or a double-edged sword. It is not necessarily energizing, quite the contrary, as Dominic Roser himself uh, recognizes, dwelling on the imagined achievement instead of working towards it hinders rather than spurs action. In that sense, hope can also be a hindrance, uh, an obstacle to successfully taking action which achieves the hope for object. The main reason for this is that hope is not, contrary to a commonly shared assumption, the opposite of anxiety. Hope is a desire whose fulfillment remains uncertain. And this is why, as Spinoza famously observed, there is no hope without fear, nor fear without hope. Hope and anxiety are both based on doubt, on uncertainty. To hope, hope for is to fear disappointment and to fear is to hope for reassurance. Spinoza adds that hope is simply an inconstant joy arising from the image of something in the future or in the past about whose outcome we are in doubt. So this does not mean that one should stop hoping, 
which is neither possible nor desirable. This rather means that in addition to cultivating hope, one should find other remedies to eco-anxiety. If hope is not the opposite of anxiety, what is? I think there are different possible candidates, but I think confidence is a good candidate here. Confidence is less about the future than about the present. It's less about what we do not know than about what we do know. And it is also less about what does not depend on us than about what does depend. There are surely many ways to cultivate confidence to uh, reduce eco-anxiety. But here I'd like to focus on the promotion of personal actions against global environmental changes. Even if global and massive problems such as climate change and biodiversity loss can seem beyond our control, we can focus on what we can do here and now, on what we know about our individual carbon footprint, and also on what we know about how we can reduce it. In short, we can focus on what depends on us. There are two major, two major categories of in individual actions that can be taken to face climate change with more confidence and less anxiety. So the first uh, is the one I mentioned here, action that directly reduce one's personal emissions. A uh, recent survey shows that there are five major high impact actions that allow individuals in developed countries to substantially reduce their annual greenhouse gas emissions. So the first one is a adopting a plant-based diet. The second uh, is uh, buying green energy, 100% renewable energy. Third is to avoid uh, taking uh, the plane, especially transatlantic flights. Uh, the fourth is having one fewer child. And the fifth one is related to our mobility. It's about uh, changing how we use our car or uh, indeed uh, living car free. So we can switch from uh, electric car to car free buy a more efficient car or simply leave uh, car free. So all these actions uh, need to be critically discussed and uh, democratically assessed, but they are representative of what needs to be done to seriously tackle individuals' high emitting lifestyles in developed countries. In addition, some high impact actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions come with substantial ecological co-benefits cool so if we take the plant-based diet, high impact action, uh, another study has stressed that moving from current diets to diets that exclude animal products at a global level would not only reduce the greenhouse gas emission of food by 49%, it would also reduce land use for food by 76%, eutrophication by 49%, and freshwater use by 19%. Taking part to this kind of collective shift in habits can give confidence that the worst scenarios, such as the Potau's Earth pathway, can still be avoided. That's the first category uh, we can uh, promote to cultivate confidence. The second category uh, and related category of individual action is to promote and support collective action against climate change. And here, individual can do two things. They can help designing institutions uh, better adapted to tackling climate change. And they can also participate in changing and creating social norms. In the case of uh, institutional reform, individuals have a wide range of possibilities at their disposals, from voting green to civil disobedience in response to government failure to push for more ambitious climate policies. In the case of social norm transformation and creation, individuals can, for instance, uh, adapt their lifestyles and develop communication strategies to amplify the effects of their green behaviors. They can also frame greener lifestyles as appealing to influence other people to reduce their own carbon footprint. And here again, these actions can help build a climate of confidence that can work as a remedy to eco-anxiety and its manifestations. But at this point, one can object that just like hope, confidence can remain wishful thinking in the face of experienced, observed, or imagined ecological disasters. When we suffer from eco-anxiety, fear leads to discouragement, which leads to paralysis. So how to break 
this virtual district circle. I think that a key solution here to break this circle of discouragement, fear and paralysis is adequate communication. When they communicate the results of their empirical research, climate scientists should insist both on the urgency of the situation and on the available means to avoid dangerous climate change. Emotional appeals to fear in order to create a sense of urgency can backfire when they lead to paralysis or other psychological defense mechanisms such as denial. For this reason, uh, Susan, Suzanne uh, Moser explains that fear appeals must be coupled with constructive information and support to reduce the danger. IPCC authors have of course already to a certain extent taken this uh, into account in their communicative strategy, but there is still a bias towards technology fixes in most IPCC scenarios, especially with negative emission technologies most recently. This bias towards technology fixes leads to an overestimation of the effectiveness of technological solutions and an underestimation of the effectiveness of changes in economies, societies, and especially in lifestyles. To combat anxiety, they could and should say more about the environmental benefits of high impact individual actions, such as the one I have just mentioned previously. Likewise, when they communicate the results of their normative research, climate justice scholars should articulate abstract duties of global and intergenerational justice with concrete courses of actions that would allow individuals and collectives to fulfill their duties. To reduce individuals' unwillingness to make lifestyle changes, so far philosophers have first and foremost promoted moral education and awareness to bring people to see environmental issues as ethical problems and persuade them that they ought to take personal actions against these, act against these issues. The task of urging moral agents to fulfill their ecological responsibilities remains, however, incomplete as long as philosophers do not propose concrete courses of action as well. Regarding individual agents, climate justice scholars should articulate the values, attitudes, and virtues they promote with behaviors that would allow people to reduce their overall environmental footprint. Regarding collective agents, for instance, uh, cities, states, and international organizations such as the UN and the EU, they should explain how these agents can comply with their duties of justice by proposing feasible institutional reforms to existing municipal, national, and international environmental policies. So far, climate justice scholarship has mostly focused on the first, more abstract task of defining and justifying principles of climate justice at the individual and collective level. The time has come to link climate justice with climate action more systematically by proposing concrete and feasible courses of action. This can play a part in replacing the virtuous circle of anxiety, fear, and paralysis with a virtuous circle of environmental awareness, confidence, and motivation. The challenge is tremendous, but we can at least partially meet it with more adequate communication. So finally, in addition to uh, researchers, both empirical and normative researchers, policymakers, both government officials and citizens, also have a key role to play to combat eco-anxiety. Policymakers are not only responsible for the state of the planet, uh, which could definitely have been improved had they taken more ambitious action sooner. They are also responsible for rising levels of eco-anxiety among children and young people, as we saw previously. This double outcome responsibility gives rise to a remedial responsibility that policymakers can partially fulfill by way of two major steps. So the first step would be to officially recognize young people's feelings by hearing and respecting them. All too often, negative feelings caused by climate anxiety 
have been dismissed, ignored, disavowed, rationalized, and negated by those in position of political power. And this is where things need to change first. Here again, communication is key. When they communicate regarding climate change, policymakers should directly address the legitimate concerns of young people. The second and obviously most important step would be to act upon the negative feelings of young people by taking ambitious environmental action. Once they have seriously acknowledged the negative feelings of young people, government officials and citizens ought to act accordingly. This means placing environmental protection not only at the top of the political agenda, but also at the center of policy making. Otherwise, we will end up in the same situation as today with discourses that seem to validate young people's worries, but that are not followed by corresponding actions. I think this is uh, fundamentally a question of integrity, a very important virtue. Policymakers should integrate their discourses and actions into a coherent whole by designing and implementing policies that correspond to the degree of emergency of the situation. Otherwise, they will keep doing too little, too late. And this too little, too late rationale is clearly illustrated by the results published in a recent report from the uh, UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which organized uh, COP21. According to this report, um, which was published a few weeks before uh, COP26, uh, sorry, not 21 or 25, as I said before, so even if all countries were to respect these current mitigation pledges, total temperature rise by the end of the century could reach 2.7 degrees Celsius about pre-industrial levels, 2.7 degrees. And this is a substantial overshoot compared to the absolute target of 2 degrees and the aspirational target of 1.5 degrees set by the Paris, Paris Agreement and reaffirmed by the Glasgow Climate Pact. Okay, we can come now to the conclusion. So eco-anxiety eco uh, can be considered as a defining feature of the Anthropocene. Uh, it is a state of mind oriented towards an uncertain future characterized by ecological risks and transcendental dangers. It is also a state of fear and insecurity in the face of an observable or imaginable anthropogenic ecological disaster that can lead to discouragement and even paralysis. It can be triggered by scientific data about the state of the world or by scenarios depicted in eco-fiction novels and films or both. Although eco-anxiety has become somewhat unavoidable, uh, it is possible to mitigate its uh, undesirable side effects such as paralysis and its psychological effects, pathological effects, sorry, such as despair. First possible way to combat eco-anxiety is to cultivate hope. Uh, in particular, hope to limit global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees and therefore to avoid the worst climate scenarios by the end of the century. Hope can be galvanizing and energizing, but it can also lead back to a key component of anxiety, fear. For the opposite of anxiety is not hope, but rather confidence. So in addition to cultivating hope, Climate change scholars, both from the empirical and the normative side, should cultivate confidence by linking climate science and climate justice more systematically with climate action, both at the individual and collective level. This can play a part in replacing the virtuous circle of anxiety, fear, and paralysis with a virtuous circle of environmental awareness, confidence, and motivation. So another message is that Adequate communication is key. Appeals to fear should be complemented by appeals to concrete courses of action that individuals can take to escape the psychological traps of paralysis and despair. Finally, adequate action by policymakers is probably the most effective remedy for eco-anxiety. Government officials and citizens should not only seriously acknowledge the negative feelings of children and young people in the face of global environmental changes, 
they should also act accordingly by implementing long overdue ambitious environmental policies. So where does this leave us in terms of uh, responsibility for future generations? If we consider that future generations already start with current children and young people who will live during the 21st century, the most important intergenerational responsibility for adults today is to promote and enable just an effective climate action, both at the individual and collective level. As we have seen, policymakers hold a special responsibility to take ambitious action at all possible levels, individual, municipal, national and international. It is now too late to count on one of these levels separately to reduce global greenhouse gas concentrations below dangerous levels. But deep decarbonization at each level simultaneously can still enable to avoid a dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. If we project ourselves now in the more distant future and uh, also take into account persons who will be born and live beyond the 21st century, this only strengthens the key normative message, uh, which is a new imperative in the Anthropocene, which we can call a sort of uh, ecological imperative. And this ecological imperative is the following, and it can be based both on empirical data or on anthropocene, uh, on, on uh, fictions. Do not venture into scenarios taking existing and future generations into a world beyond two degrees Celsius or other formulation possible. Do not risk yourselves in pathways that are dangerous, not only for children and young people, but also for their children and grandchildren. Climate scenarios in the scientific literature and in eco-fictions give us a picture that is accurate enough to confidently state that this would be one of the most severe imaginable intergenerational injustice. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the talk. Uh, yes. it, was, it was really, really interesting, inspiring, and, and uh, I think that uh, a lot of ideas uh, we can we can we can develop a lot of ideas from from your presentation. So we can collect the question. You can start if you want uh, with two or three points. Um, the first one, I'm I'm curious about um, your idea of uh, eco anxiety and the notion of a heuristic fear. Uh, which was developed by Hans Jonas. Um, is there any um, any part of, of your idea that, uh, that is uh, close to the Jonas one or to the Jonas analysis uh, or not? Because uh, it seems to me that uh, there are there are there are uh, um, parts of, of your thesis that uh, can be can, can be considered very close to the Jonas one. Um, the second point is about uh, um, this particular form of, of anxiety. Uh, I mean, do you think that uh, uh, you can, uh, um, there is any overlapping between, uh, between general idea of anxiety and this specific form or not? Uh, because the notion of anxiety was discussed, for example, by Heidegger and other philosophers. So uh, my question is, is there any specificity in the echo anxiety uh, um, uh, regarding to the general notion of anxiety uh, or not from your point of view? Yes, two very good questions. Thank you. Um, regarding the first, uh, I hadn't thought about it, but um, I see now that you mentioned it, the direct link with, between uh, discussions on eco-anxiety and the notion of uh, heuristic fear in Jonas. Um, so the way I understood this notion is to use fear as a tool to motivate people to, to act against environmental issues. And he, he does this in a very, uh, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but in a very deontological perspective, taking the the principle that we should preserve at all costs authentic human life on Earth, and I think he redefines the Kantian categorical imperative this way, 
And I think this would be close to what I'm trying to say with the ecological imperative. So I would see a very strong relation here, indeed, between what I'm saying and what uh, Hans Jonas is saying. I think it's all based on this idea that transcendental dangers are threatening authentic human life on Earth. And this would be one of the most severe uh, global and intergenerational injustice we can imagine. So we need to redefine the categorical imperative and take into account um, the ecological conditions that are behind the a good human life. So this would be one way to try to uh, link environmental thinking with uh, deontological theory inspired by Kant. Um, and I think that that might be very promising. And Hans Jonas has been proposing something going definitely in this direction. So I would definitely agree that uh, this is a good place to try to develop what I've been saying uh, so far. Um, regarding your second question, what, what is particular in the form of eco-anxiety? So, um, the first element, the fact that it is future oriented is definitely uh, related to all form of anxiety. Also the uh, possible pathological element related to mental health. We found those in all form of anxiety as well. Um, I'm, I'm not very, or I'm not familiar enough with Heidegger's conception, but a lot of people of course mention uh, Freud, Sigmund Freud's approach to eco-anxiety. I think all the main elements I've mentioned can be found in XIT to core. Uh, perhaps the distinctive element here is this idea that is really focused on uh, on, on global uh, ecological risks. So it's the the object of anxiety here is uh, either um, ecological phenomena or impacts such as sea level rise, uh, mega fires, um, drought, floods, or their impact on the human and the non-human world. And I think that's a, a new rising form of anxiety. And uh, a lot of people have been feeling it like a new way to experiment anxiety in the 21st century. Um, I think there are many different forms. I've, I've mentioned also existential anxiety. And I think here we are closer to Heidegger, probably, sort of an ontological fear. Um, but the, the distinctive element of eco-anxiety is that it's directly related to environmental element. And there is this sub form of eco-anxiety, which is climate anxiety. So usually I, I use the two in a synonymous way, but maybe we can make some additional uh, distinction between them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Alex, Alex Putzer? Right, you Hello, um, the internet is not working super well. I hope you can understand me. Thank you for the for the presentation. I would have two questions, and one is related um, to the previous um, to the previous question about the type of anxiety. Because from your response, it seemed that what changes is not the anxiety itself, but the motivation. So it's focused on um, global ecological risks. So in a sense, wouldn't it be fruitful to compare eco-anxiety with anxieties of the past, maybe in the 80s, the anxiety of nuclear war, and see what was proposed back then to combat anxiety, and then it could work if it's the same type of anxiety. Um, and the second one might be from what you wrote about what can be done against eco-anxiety, I was wondering if you make a difference between responses to the cause and to the effect, because you wrote about um, efficient environmental protection and everything, and all those elements could be used to combat climate change and company. So in a sense, we are fighting the cause, but not necessarily the anxiety itself. Um, so maybe to fight anxiety without fighting the cause would be to do meditation or or take drugs, maybe, to be provocative, uh, provocatively. Um, so, yeah, those are the two things. Thank you very much. I turned off my camera. Apology. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for these two questions and for bringing provocative elements to this discussion. Um, so, 
the first question, yes, um, I think it might be indeed very interesting to compare um, climate anxiety with anxiety in the not so distant past. So I think uh, nuclear war or nuclear arms race, um, which has also led for decades to very strong feeling of anxiety in the general population. So uh, I haven't read the literature on this, but I totally agree that there might be very interesting elements here of comparison, both in terms of definition and also in terms of uh, how to find ways to cope with anxiety. So um, I, I take this uh, interesting insight and I will also um, integrate it. And the, the second, so the distinction between um, focusing on causes and effects um, yeah, I've been I've been focusing mostly on how to to reduce uh, ecological risks, which is the source or the major object of eco anxiety. So I've been focusing mostly on the cause, and I've been focusing especially on the notion of mitigation. So how to mitigate our emissions both individually and collectively. If we move now to the effects perspective, and for instance the effects of climate change, here we can think more in terms of uh, adaptation. Uh, I think it might be an interesting framework to develop uh, to try to reapply this traditional uh, dichotomy or traditional distinction, at least between mitigation and adaptation. In the case of eco anxiety, we can focus either on a mitigation or on adaptation. And in the case of adaptation here, indeed, we have other remedies. Uh, even if we do not focus directly on ecological risks, we can adapt to a warming world. This is something we will have to do anyway. So this is, must be some part of the solution anyway. So um, meditation, indeed, uh, might be an interesting point. Taking taking drugs may, made me think a little bit about um, Marx's remark that uh, religion is the opium of the people. Um, usually philosophers prefer much more focusing with truth, even if it's carry rather than trying to uh, find solution that make us ignore truth. So finding ways to face truth, uh, finding ways to uh, face the fear that come with facing truth, but without relying for this on drugs or for that matter on, on religion. So taking the, the Marxist approach by saying religion is just a human construction, we won't find any solution there. If we do, we will be alienated and uh, finding solutions elsewhere. And uh, here again, I think uh, drawing on more traditional forms of anxiety can be very interesting. So getting back to Freud's analysis of uh, anxiety and seeing if uh, meditation, uh, yoga, or that, that's indeed a more much more recent approach, but meditation and other forms of remedy to traditional forms of uh, anxiety that can also be interesting. Yes, thank you. Okay. Other question? Fausto? Thank you so very much. For your... May I, uh, uh, yes, after Fausto? No, 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 after you, Fausto, if I may add yeah, some, some words. Absolutely. No, I was saying thank you very much for your interesting talk. I really appreciate it. And I have two like comments or questions, slash question. The first one is partially related to what Tiziana asked you before. Because I was thinking that, yes, hope can be somehow a double-edged sword, let's say. Meaning that, for example, if you place trust and hope in geoengineering, just to make an example, um, if you consider geoengineering as a silver bullet that will save us for, from, from, from climate change, then, for example, you can have the negative effect that actu actually you lose any incentive in reducing your carbon, carbon footprint. So my first question, if, if, if we agree with this, that, I mean, there is also another side of hope, like a bad side. And, and then the other comment is about the point that you made it, 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 um, in the first part of the presentation. And it's when you say that you can be at the same time hopeful and pessimistic. Uh, and, and I agree with this. Uh, and then you also quoted Dominique Roser when you say, I, I took a note, actually, you say that, I mean, Roser says that I can believe X to have a low probability, but still the SRX and psychologically rally around X. Uh, so I, I was thinking as, as a reaction, yes, you can do it, but you are fooling yourself. 
I mean, um, you can do it, but is it rational or irrational in your in your view? So mm. these are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. Very well, uh, very interesting as well. Um, so regarding the first one, yes. The, so you further stress the the possible negative side effects of hope and. Here you point, for instance, to uh, hope in geoengineering as a silver bullet to fight against climate change. So another risk of hope is if we apply it to uh, the wrong object. So I took a positive object, um, or at least a positively connoted object, with the 1.5 degrees goal. If we hope for this uh, object, then this might have positive side effects, such as motivation, energization, galvanization but if we apply hope to more problematic elements such as typically geoengineering which a lot of climate ethicists have stressed as a ethically problematic way to try to address climate change here we might end up indeed with um, a morally problematic picture so i totally agree with you and actually geoengineering um, is taken into account in those anthropocene fiction so uh, some movies have already been depicting possible side effects of geoengineering. Um, so this is directly taken into account uh, in the um, Anthropocene fiction as well, in a good illustration of what happens if uh, we put too much hope uh, in a technical solution. And in general, hoping for several bullet in general might be something negative in climate change because there are so many sides of it in terms, not only in terms of mitigation, which is already very complicated, but also adaptation, compensation. Uh, we should stop seeing climate change as a problem that needs to be solved, but something we should live again, live with, adapt to, and mitigate as far as possible. But this is very limited too. Um, second, this idea that we can be hopeful and pessimistic at the same time. But if we are pessimistic, but we continue to hope for the object, this can be irrational. Um, I think it raises an important question. Um, is um, anxiety something that is irrational uh, or rational? Is hope something rational or irrational? So here we are in this traditional distinction between what is more er emotional, what is more rational. There's a lot to say about this. I think regarding um, anxiety, it's fair to stress that it's not necessarily um, something uh, irrational. And that's why I think it's interesting to make the link between the fact of anxiety and uh, the fact of uh, reasonable pluralism in a democratic society. Um, Eco-anxiety can be a totally rational reaction to the state of the planets. Um, we can observe this in form of uh, ecological events, but we can also simply read IPCC reports. I think anyone who reads and understands the last two IPCC reports has to feel anxiety. Um, indeed, most of the authors are anxious about the future. So I think it's, it's a rational reaction to the world in which we live today. Now, regarding hope, uh, if we hope for something, but at the same time, we are pessimistic about this outcome, um, there might be some irrationality to it, but it depends if 1.5 degrees, for instance, is something we just take as intrinsically good, but all, or we also make the distinction between intrinsically and instrumentally. And I think what Dominic Roser is pointing to is that we need to take the 1.5 degrees and hope for 1.5 degrees as an instrument to uh, motivate action. And in this case, I think even if we can remain pessimistic that we can reach 1.5 degrees, we can use this goal just as an instrument to encourage action and maybe that that's one way to to try to deal with the more irrational side of uh, of hope thank you very much okay alberto you are the next one yes if i may let me add uh, uh, my name as well to the list of uh, person uh, that are uh, expressing the uh, gratitude uh, for your paper and your brilliant presentation it's really interesting uh, and it's also interesting because you touched upon the, 
the beauty of individual motivation, to me at least from my point of view, uh, the idea of individual motivation, the contribution that individuals can give uh, to, to, to countering uh, climate change or in any case, uh, the worsening of a, a state of the present state of affairs. And last but not least, uh, because you isolated another, uh, another possible candidate of the, uh, to be added in the list of negative emotions that should be uh, raised and should be considered by speaking about climate change. In my turn, I try to work on, on uh, intergenerational indifference, and this is another case uh, in which we can uh, imagine uh, how uh, negative emotions are working in this uh, in such a question. Now, uh, going to the to the to the point, or at least to one or two points, uh, I really must appreciate also your attempt for establishing, for sketching out a sort of phenomenology of uh, this uh, negative emotion of eco density. I was wondering about these uh, uh, two or three specific things. First, uh, let me ask what is specific of eco anxiety as compared to the general state of insecurity. Therefore, from, from a phenomenological point of view, eco anxiety is not, a, let's say, a nuance or a sort of a possible declination of, of a more general sense or uh, uh, awareness of insecurity. And uh, if not, what is so specific to isolate is okay, we can say eco. So the suffix is the one is specific, uh, but uh, which kind of anxiety or which kind of different anxiety this might produce? I'm perfectly aware that the, the answering this issue would have opened up also a book of a psychology in a sense, no? it is uh, strongly related to a very interdisciplinary approach, but still encourage at least because it's really close to my own research agenda. Second point, and since you mentioned uh, this uh, transcendental danger, well, I let's say recording my ancient uh, passages in Canada by, by being a Kantian scholar as well, I was wondering two things. First, in which sense, and you probably made the, the, the distinction between the risk and damage that Anthony Giddens raised it first through your definition of anxiety. So, anxiety is a risk. Anxiety is a danger, and they are pretty close to get its definition of all distant for other reasons. Yes, or if not, uh, both have interest to me. Second point, uh, um, again, what is, uh, well, basically, this was a definition raised up by Burke 2013, if I took a right note. Those so the idea of transcendental danger. But what is a transcendental danger at the very end? It's a sort of a, a fear, a second level of fear. So a fear of having a fear for having fear. And if yes, again, this is something which is related to a more general status than just a, a, an ecological one or an environmental one. And last but not least, because this is also an objection that I try to counter. Why politician? Why? Do a politician, why should a politician be motivated in adopting uh, measures that are uh, in favor of individual behavior since they don't have a specific, uh, a specific uh, let's say, payoff or trade off uh, from uh, such a kind of political agency? According to the service that you presented to us, uh, they are most, uh, there are two. People, so two kind of populations that are more, uh, let's say, open and sensitive to such a kind of issues, namely the scientists and children. But they are not voting at all uh, in the second case, or they are a very, a very few people in the, in the first one. Therefore, the nimbus in your better than not in my political terms, though, might be an answer for, for the results of such a kind. Service less than be discouraged. Thanks again for your very, very insightful paper and presentation. I'm happy to, uh, to, I'm really curious to about your answer in order to 
go ahead and prolong it or discuss. Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this very uh, positive and uh, challenging feedback. Um, um, I'm sorry, I, I don't totally, uh, the quality of the sound, I didn't hear all the words, but I think I, I made most of your three questions. So I think, let, let me know if I'm not answering totally and then you can ask follow-ups, but uh, they, are, they are all, from what I understood, very challenging questions. So first, uh, what is so specific to eco-anxiety, uh, if we contrast it with a uh, question of uh, insecurity or uncertainty? So. Um, on working the paper, I've been looking on traditional accounts of uh, anxiety and the three major factors that usually come up uh, in the discussion in the literature are indeed uh, uncertainty, unpredictability, and uncontrollability. So we are not certain, we can difficult, we have difficulty to predict, and we cannot control the object of anxiety. So this this seems to be three recurrent features in all forms of anxiety. I think the difference is that anxiety is more encompassing. It's a more general notion than insecurity um, because it's a, it's a notion in the sense, at least I understand it, eco-anxiety, it's, it's a notion that focuses on uh, ecological risks. So it's one specific way to try to, to deal with uncertainty. Um, I think this is also re related to um, the, the second question you asked about transcendental danger. So we have the uncertainty and uh, we have the notion of risk and they are intrinsically linked because uh, as Henry Hsu explains, risks are the product of magnitude and probability. And in case of moving from risk to danger, I think the question of probability re becomes less relevant. And this is the how I understand the shift between risk in which we have always both the probability and the magnitude and danger. Danger we can not totally set aside, but probability becomes less important because loss and damage are so massive that even if their probability is very low, this is not very important. Uh, for instance, in the case of, uh, if we take the case of the hot house earth pathway, um, we don't know exactly the probability of realizing it because they just say it's around two degrees. Sometimes they say it's around 1.5 degrees. So the, the probability of when we trigger it, uh, this is not the important point. The point is the magnitude of the harm that would unfold if we go into this direction. And I think that's why um, some authors such as Dominique Bourg explain that when we speak in terms of such huge, uh, such huge ecological impacts, we need to move from risk to danger. Risk, according to, to them, is a way of underestimating what we are facing. Uh, we really need to focus very much more on the magnitude of the loss and damage. And according to them, but this is one interpretation, the notion of danger could be more efficient to do so. Um, and the third question, it's, it's always a very uh, difficult one. Um, so anytime we speak about intergenerational responsibility, we know that we live in a uh, political system that are very uh, short-sighted. Uh, there is always focus on present problems or problems in the last next years because the mandate of politicians who want to be reelected have to focus on the next few years or so. Um, so how to motivate them to adopt measure uh, to fight against environmental issues, especially as you point out, when we know that it's people who do not vote that feel the most uh, eco-anxiety. Um, I think one way to, to try to uh, express this motivation that uh, politicians can have is to explain the crucial role that uh, environmental environmental issues and environment in general plays in making just societies possible. So th this is something we have, uh, we can find implicitly in John Rawls's theory of justice. When he speaks about the circumstances of justice, he says um, to make a just society possible, there are uh, subjective circumstances and objective circumstances. Uh, subjective, for instance, is the sense of justice. 
people should have enough sense of justice and objective he says we should not have uh we should have enough natural resources but we should not be in uh, over abundant states either the problem with uh, environmental issues such as climate change and biodiversity loss is that we are threatening uh the objective uh, circumstances of justice this means that the very condition of possibility of just institutions are now being threatened and i think this is a question of concern for any any question we would like to ask uh, in in any kind of question in the political sense in the economic sense in social sense if just institutions become impossible uh, there is no way to try to pursue uh, electoral circles and so on so i think one other way to try to stress this would be to to take this notion stressed, stressed by Brenna Holland. She says that ecological stability is a meta capability. Um, this means that if the politician takes seriously the capabilities of their uh, of their people, um, then they should understand that environmental stability is a condition of possibility of these capabilities. Um, I imagine that this. Um, remains very theoretical and for a lot of politicians uh, coming maybe from the right side of uh, the political issue, this might be uh, totally insufficient, but that's all I can find for now to, to reply to this big challenge. Okay, Martina wrote uh a question in in the chat uh, when you say officially recognizing your people's feeling are you suggesting that the creation of rights are related to that sorry can you repeat the question i'm not sure i understood it yeah. when you say officially recognize young people's feeling this is mm -hmm. the question are you suggesting uh, the creation of rights related to that the, the creation of specific rights, uh, like yeah, uh, I, I environmental exactly rights or human. So I didn't think about this in this perspective, but it might be interesting. Um, what, what I had in mind with, with this idea of officially recognizing um, the expressions of eco-anxiety by young people and children, it's more the, um, the traditional reactions we have seen so far by, by many politicians who just tend to this value or uh, underestimate these concerns because as we have just uh, discussed in, in the previous question, they are not voters currently. So the idea of officially uh, recognizing young people's feelings, it's more in the official political discourse. That's the first step. And the second step, um, is to act on this discourse, which uh, officially recognizes their feeling. That's that's the way I conceive it, and I'm trying to think on how rights might fit in it. Uh, but I I failed to do so. But perhaps the the person who has the question has a has a more precise idea. So if she wants to, uh, I ask. think that uh, uh, that that. Uh... Uh, Martina uh, was traveling, so is not connecting anymore. Okay, so yes, she, I understand. She will. Uh, <laughs> okay. But maybe the idea would be uh, that the young people and children have a, yeah, they have a basic right to have their um, current feeling recognized. So this this might be a, a way to frame it, which would be interesting. And this might be a, a way I would be very happy to pursue because in general I'm very much in favor of, of human rights. And then the question would be how we can connect this right with, uh, with pre-existing rights. But um, I need to think more about it, but I think sure. it's an interesting way to think about it. Okay, we, we have two more questions. Um, one by uh, Jace, I, I, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, but I hope it's quite, in, quite similar to the proper way of pronouncing the name. And the, and the last one uh, is uh, from Gregorio. So Jace, Lute. Hi, um, can... yeah, you 
you got the pronunciation right. Thank you. Um, right. one, of my research, one of my research interests is examining the limits of keeping this phenomenon um, kind of within the realm of anxiety alone. So I'm really happy that Alberto spoke before me because I can kind of build on that rather than go off on my own direction here. Um, given that eco-anxiety is, is identified as a feature of the Anthropocene, um, relating that concept um, as being directly an impact of colonialism seems like it's not out of scope. Um, I'm curious to what extent, um, I'm not familiar with the literature here, especially Hans Jonas, but I'm curious if there's a consideration for Franz Fanon here, and if so, to what extent? Okay, um, yeah, thank you very much. Any any way to try to link current uh, political theory with colonialism is much welcome. I think it's part of the effort to, to decolonize the curriculum and part of the effort to try to put uh, colonial questions that have been set aside for a very long time into uh, both our teaching and our research. So I'm very much in favor of it. Again, I haven't been thinking directly about it in uh, the scope uh, of the paper, but what, what I've been, the, the way I've been trying to think about uh, colonialism is the the way we can link it with uh, climate injustice. So there, there is a lot of discussion in the climate justice literature on holding uh, industrialized countries responsible for their past emission. And here we have this idea of uh, historical justice that arise. Uh, we can say that developed countries are responsible for past emission because it is a form of uh, historical injustice. And um, I think this this is related to colonialism in the sense that industrialized countries are also the one that are responsible uh, for colonization. And this make this creates a double responsibility. They are responsible because they have emitted the most, but they are also responsible because they have uh, forced a lot of countries uh, in the south to remain more vulnerable to climate change because the current poverty of a lot of country can be traced back to institutions that come from colonialism. Even if those countries are no independence because of colonialism, they are uh, much less well economically developed and they are much less well equipped to uh, adapt to climate change. So this is how I think we can relate this uh, discourse on colonialism with climate justice in general with this idea of historical injustice and now how how that would relate to um equal anxiety um i i i have to think about it i'm happy if you have any any, any suggestion on how this might be done but so far i'm i don't know jc do you want to add something or is it a I have a follow up in a second, but some other people have questions. It sounds like so. Oh wait, is it short? I think because it's a follow up, so you can you can do it. Okay. Um. I just so I guess um my feelings are that we might be flattening our understanding of this phenomenon by keeping it in the realm of anxiety alone. Um. To kind of pull on Franz Fanon, um, Brush of the Earth. There's a quote. Let me find that real quick. Um. So he's talking about reactionary psychoses in this part, um, page 250 of Richard of the Earth. It seems to us in the cases here chosen, the events giving rise to the disorder are chilly, the bloodthirsty and pitiless atmosphere, the generalization of inhuman practices and the firm impression for the people have of being caught up in a veritable apocalypse. And that just seems really relevant here. Yes. No, it's a very interesting um, excerpt from Fanon. Um, so I... I will definitely keep this in mind and I will draw on that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Gregorio, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Um, mine more than a question is meant to be uh, a stimulus, uh, let's say, to reflect. Uh, since it seems to me that there is a, <clears throat> an, an essential distinction uh, that on the speculative level cannot be neglected, which is the difference between fear and uh, anxiety. We were 
dis discussing last time about it. Uh, if we insist on the greater or uh, lesser uncertainty of anxiety or on the possibility of managing it, I think that we remain at the level of the psychologistic descriptivism uh, of the state of mind and we escape the fundamental theoretical question, uh, which is that fear is fear of the determined. Fear cannot be regardless of the genitive. It is always fear of something, Phobos to. The basic characteristic of anxiety, on the other hand, is the, the uh, lack of genitive, so that there is anxiety even without the concrete imminence of the danger. There is anxiety even in absence of the danger, because anxiety uh, is oriented toward uh, the wholeness and in particular towards the disappearance of the whole. That is the conceptual core of what you call climate anxiety or uh, ecological uh, anxiety. However, and I conclude, if this is the case, this or that type of anxiety is not given, but only, only the very general conception of uh, anxiety is given. Yes, thank you. Very good remark. So I, I totally agree with you on this distinction between fear, which is uh, always uh, with a uh, particular or determined object, and anxiety, which is something oriented towards a uh, much less determined object. And as you say, we can have anxiety even without the imminence of, of danger. And I think that's why it's important to to be as specific as possible regarding the what anxiety is about. Um, it's all part of the challenge because it's about something that is not as determinate as fear. And I think the reason why it's um, relevant to take ecological risks as the object of anxiety is that it remains something quite indeterminate. So we usually when we speak in terms of risk, there is always a form of anxiety. There is always a form of projection in an in the future which is unclear and even if with climate sciences now we can predict a lot of climate impacts even at a regional level the specificity of anxiety compared with with fear is that it remains so um, blurry and i think that's that's part of why it is so potentially um, difficult to live with indeed why it, it can be so pathological um, since the object is always something that is away in front of us and we always project ourselves in this future which is indeterminate it's always on the horizon and it's very difficult to get rid of anxiety if fear is if is of more determinate close objects in space and time uh, once we have faced it then we can go beyond our fear with anxiety it's almost impossible to face it because it's always somewhere in front of us and that's why it's a pervasive feature of our time and i think that's the distinction you make is a is a nice way to try to explain why why we cannot really escape it. So I totally uh, agree. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Alessandro. Thank you very much uh, for your paper. Uh, very simulating. And um, my question, more or less, is connected to the previous remarks from Tiziana and uh, more or less Fausto. And uh, it's a really fast question related. To what do you think about the role of technology? Because uh, if you consider uh, eco anxiety or the the idea of Anthropocene, I think that technology plays a central role in this uh, in this period. And thinking, for example, to the the meaning of technology given by Heidegger in his essay, we have the possibility maybe to discuss. Uh, uh, or to deepen uh, more the role of the technologies uh, in this uh, your new paradigm of eco anxiety. Yes, very good question. Thank you. Um, I think um, technology is definitely at the at the center of uh, economic, political, and scientific discourse on climate change. Uh, so especially now with the the rising notion of negative emissions. So the idea that we made might have by the middle of the century negative emission technologies um, allows us today to adjust our carbon budgets we can overshoot and then we make the bet that by 
uh, 2050, we will be intelligent enough uh, to have new technologies that do not exist yet to then compensate the overshoot so that by the end of the century, two degrees remain possible. Um, the, the problem with, with this kind of this specific kind of technology, which is unproven technology, is that it it, it relies on a bet. We just bet that we will be intelligent enough and that we might be able to manipulate um, the the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere so that we can absorb it and and uh, safely store it. And uh, if we look back at history and how we've been manipulating even small ecosystems, usually it always comes with an uh, anticipated side effects. And uh, if we do this at the global level, this will be very problematic. So I think the, the best way to, to reply to your question is to make the distinction between uh, proven and unproven technology, and also technologies that manipulate the climate system at the global level and less intrusive technologies. So if we take the case of mitigation and we speak in terms of uh, decarbonization of uh, the energy mix, uh, for, to do so, we definitely need a lot of technologies, especially renewable technologies. So all kinds of research on uh, solo, solar power, hydraulic power, wind power, this needs to be developed and we need this technology here and in developing countries. So this is a part of uh, technological innovation, which is definitely uh, something that needs to be developed. But at the same time, um, when I was speaking about the kind of solution put forward very often in the IPCC report, I have the impression that they tend to overestimate what can be done with these technologies. and underestimate what we can do uh, individually. So in the, in the case of high impact actions I have mentioned, for instance, uh, adopting a plant-based diet or without living without car or avoiding taking the plane, those are all solutions uh, that do not rely on technology. And indeed, a lot of solutions are solutions that make us avoid those technologies that are possible, that are polluting. So the basic idea is to say that we need those technologies to mitigate uh, global emissions, but at the individual level, even relying to on any specific form of technology, there is a, already a lot we can do to to reduce uh, our um, carbon footprint. And I think the the most um, the most obvious one is to change our diets. There is no no form of technology included here if we move from uh, a diet based on animal products to uh, diet based on plant products. We do not have to rely on any specific form of technology usually discussed in the discussion on mitigation. So I think that's that's why we need to uh, promote more this kind of action and explain that they are both possible and with good side effects, both on the environment and on our health. Thank you very much. I, I only say that for an Italian, it's quite difficult to change diet. <laughs> I come from Switzerland and France, so it's uh, I can relate on this difficulty. <laughs> okay, we have another question by Andre Betasefa, who wrote the question in the chat. Uh, the question has three parts, I, it seems so. The first one, um, given that anxiety involves psychological concern, do you think that that uh, eco anxiety is a problem of an individual agent or an issue of the collective society? Okay, so I think it originates uh, individually in our um, it's a psychological issue that originates individually, but the only way to to properly tackle it is collectively, and that's something I. I I pointed out in the conclusion by saying that one of the biggest responsibility we have today, um, both in terms of global and international justice, is to enable a fair transition. So, for instance, when I was speaking about those low impact actions, there is only so much individuals can do. Uh, it's very important that the structures around people are changed so that they can reduce their carbon footprint should they choose to do so. And this is why. Here we have a very uh, clear articulation between the individual and the collective level. 
The only way for people to feel confident about how they can act to reduce their environmental footprint is that collectivities, especially cities, governments, create structures that enable us to act so that we can reduce our ecological footprints. So I think it's on both accounts. It comes from the individual level, but we need to move to the collective level to tackle it. Okay, the second part of the question is the following. What do you think about the implication of uh, environmental ecological pragmatism in approaching eco-anxiety issues? Yes, good question. So, so this is more related to, I think, the way I understand um, ecological pragmatism, it's more related to uh, another point uh, I was pointing out uh, also in the conclusion, this idea that one way um, we can act as individuals so as to reduce our uh, ecological footprint is to contribute to reform uh, existing institutions. And when we think about how we can reform institutions, one uh, constraint we need to take into account is feasibility constraints, and especially in terms of political feasibility. And this is this topic of feasibility is a topic that has been uh, discussed for a long time by uh, ecological uh, pragmatists. Um, in the case of climate justice, the author I know the best is Andrew Light. And uh, Andrew Light has been uh, responsible now for several years to negotiate uh, on climate change uh, as being part of the US delegation. And when he publishes on climate justice and he speaks in terms of international uh, negotiations and reforms, he always takes into account what is feasible and what is not feasible. So I think we need to take into account this uh, kind of pragmatic constraint into account when we, ex when we think about how we can reform existing institutions. Because if we just take ideal theory, and starts by being very too far from where we are today in terms of existing institutions, then our uh, institutional reform recommendations will not probably not change anything. So we need this pragmatic way of thinking to directly explain how we can reduce our uh, individual footprint by contributing to reforming existing institutions. Okay, thank you. This is the very last question, the third part of um, a safer question. What do you think about the traditional or indigenous eco-friendly consciousness in approaching eco-anxiety? Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have any um, expertise on this topic, so I, I cannot uh, reply to you, but I definitely write this down and this is something I will uh, take into account in the, in the paper when I will improve it. Thank you. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, I think that's enough also for our <laughs> guest, which was very kind in answering uh, to all questions, suggestions, comments. Uh, so thank you again for this brilliant uh, talk and to everyone for the participation and discussion. Next section of our seminar will be on November 30. Uh, with Samantha Knoll uh, from Washington State University. Uh, who will, she will talk about uh, balancing food security and ecological resilience in the age of the Anthropocene. So we will, met, we will meet in uh, two weeks again. Thank you very much. Sounds like a very interesting paper. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to you all. It was a very rich discussion and a pleasure to present my paper to you. So. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, Papa Rosso, my dear. Okay. Very nice uh, presentation and time. Bye bye. Thanks again. Oh. Bye. Bye, bye. Thanks a lot. Ciao a tutti. Bye bye. Ciao a tutti. Buonasera. Ciao a